Earthquake Effects, Part 1, Shaking. The most obvious effect of an earthquake is shaking. But shaking isn't what worries us so much. It's the effect of the shaking on our buildings. This building used to be an upright garage at Cal State Northridge. Then along came the Northridge earthquake. This is what happened. Rigid building materials like adobe and unreinforced brick and concrete do very poorly during earthquakes. In 1933, the Long Beach earthquake resulted in the collapse of unreinforced brick school buildings, prompting the first building codes in Los Angeles. Codes were updated in the 1950s and are constantly undergoing update as we learn more about earthquakes. Very few places have better building codes than Southern California. One way to make larger buildings safe is to isolate the base the base is able to absorb the shock so that the rest of the building can stay upright. On the left you can see two buildings, two scale buildings, the one on the right has an isolated base. So most of the large buildings in downtown LA, such as the LA City Hall, is isolated and therefore can withstand pretty good sized earthquakes. Many countries do not have good building codes, or like Turkey, their codes may not be enforced. As a result, a 7.4 earthquake in Turkey resulted in over 17,000 deaths. Compare that to a 6.7 Northridge earthquake that resulted in 72 deaths. By far the safest building to be in during an earthquake is a single-story wooden framed house, which describes the vast majority of houses in Los Angeles. Wood is excellent at absorbing the shock of earthquake waves. The only reason that this house was damaged by the San Fernando earthquake of 1971 was that it was not bolted down to its foundation. The shock of the earthquake pushed the house straight up into the air and it landed off its foundation. To sell a house nowadays in Los Angeles, you have to prove that it has been, in fact, bolted down properly to its foundation. Another effect of earthquakes is the permanent displacement of the ground. Here you can see a fault line that has displaced this jeep trail to the right. So this is a right lateral strike slip fault from the Hector Mine earthquake in the Mojave Desert. Here you have vertical displacement creating a scarp of over six feet high from a 7.3 earthquake in Idaho. During an earthquake, water saturated soil can behave like a fluid causing the structures sitting on the soil to sink. This process is called liquefaction. The water between the sand grains can be under so much pressure that the water can escape to the surface, bringing sand along with it, creating these unusual sand volcanoes, as you can see in this diagram. The Loma Prieta earthquake that struck the San Francisco Bay area did little damage near its epicenter but it did destroy the more distant Marina District. The Marina District was created by filling in part of the San Francisco Bay with rubble from the 1906 San Francisco earthquake. The fill soil suffered from liquefaction. The Van Norman Dam was also under pressure from the water in the 1971 San Fernando earthquake. There was an underwater landslide and the dam almost failed. If it had, it would have taken out a large part of the San Fernando Valley. Earthquakes can trigger landslides. This house was once on Chautauqua just above PCH when the Northridge earthquake struck. There were so many landslides triggered by the Northridge earthquake that the surrounding mountains emitted clouds of dust. In that dust were spores of a fungus that infected a number of people with a respiratory infection called valley fever. By far the most destructive effect of an earthquake is a tsunami or seismic sea wave also incorrectly referred to as a tidal wave. Tsunamis are caused by an underwater earthquake that displaces the ocean floor which in turn displaces the water above it. The Sumatran earthquake occurred in the Sumatran Trench in the Indian Ocean. There was no warning system in place. In the Pacific Ocean there is a warning system in place because we've known that the Pacific Ocean with its many subduction zones 
is capable of producing large earthquakes, a subduction zone is a prime spot for a tsunami because one plate is trying to subduct underneath another. The left plate subducts under the right, which bends elastically until it snaps, creating an earthquake, as well as a wave. The wave then moves outward in all directions. This is a visualization of the Sumatran earthquake. The crests are in red and the troughs are in blue as the earthquake waves travel across the Indian Ocean and refract around islands. A tsunami wave is very different from a regular wind-generated wave. Whereas a wind-generated wave might be 10 feet high and 300 feet long, a tsunami wave could be 60 miles long. But out in the deep ocean, it would only be about 1 to 2 feet high, so you would not notice it if it was going by you in the deep ocean. It would go by, however, very quickly. As a tsunami approaches shore, it can get 10 times higher and shorter, but still go very, very fast. The reason that it shortens up is that when the waves reach shore, the bottom of the wave starts to drag on the ocean. That causes it to shorten and increase in height. Sometimes the trough will arrive first so that the water will withdraw that would be a good time to leave. In this picture of the tsunami generated by the Sumatran earthquake, you can see that the trough arrived first, but not everyone understood what that meant. It's not the height of the wave that's really the problem. Regular waves from wind can be very high. It's the fact that the tsunami wave is so long. An earthquake wave continues inward until it's simply a wall of water washing in over the land. Coming in over the land is only half the problem, then it will recede, carrying all of the debris with it. Here's Sri Lanka with normal wind waves. Here's the tsunami coming in, and here it is going back out again. Just because you've witnessed one tsunami doesn't mean that that's the only wave. Tsunamis come in waves of four, five, as many as ten, and the first one may not necessarily be the highest. In 1960, Hawaii received a tsunami. The first one was only about four feet high. Half an hour later was a higher one. Some people assumed that was it and that they were safe and returned to their homes. However, within another half hour was one that from crest to trough was 20 feet high, and this wave wiped out a large part of Hilo, Hawaii. Is coastal Los Angeles in danger? Well, I'm afraid the answer is yes. If you're at the beach and you feel an earthquake 20 seconds or longer, you have no way of knowing where that earthquake was generated. It's probably generated on land and won't create a tsunami. But if you don't know, it's better to be safe and get out of there. Also, if you see some change in the water, I suggest you run. Where do you run? You need to get to higher ground. I don't suggest that you go into like the marina, Marina del Rey. If you go into a bay, things could get worse because waves can be increased by bays. Your second choice would be to go up to the third story of a multi-story building. It's called vertical evacuation and works out quite well. Well, when all else fails, you could climb a tree. A number of people have saved their lives by climbing trees during a tsunami. Will we have warning in Los Angeles? Well, that depends. If it's a local earthquake from a local landslide or right offshore, there won't be enough time for a warning. We live on the ring of fire, and you could have a tsunami generated in Alaska, in Japan, Hawaii, and all of those could create a tsunami, but it will take a long time to get to us. And we will have warning. NOAA, the National Oceanographic and Atmospheric Administration, has put up buoys throughout the Pacific. And these buoys will monitor the tsunamis and will give us warning for everything except the most locally generated tsunami.